Welcome back to the Hank Strange Situation, Lifestyles of the Locked and Loaded. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Hank Strange, and of course we're here with Sam Andrews of Andrews Custom Leather. Thanks for having us again, Sam. It's a pleasure. It's always fun. And uh, one of the things, people want to see us do single action guns, right? Some right. period style stuff. Cowboy. Exactly. And all uh, the things we've been making for the movies the last couple of years has been primarily pretty much been that. cowboy yeah. stuff. Yeah. So we've got a very good example here. This is really ornate, some nicely carved leather here. Now, do you do that stuff? I myself don't. I have a young assistant, Dominic Whitaker. He's a genius at carving. He's been a real godsend to have yeah. in the shop. Awesome. So we're going to walk people through how you do this, right? right? How you wind up with something as awesome yeah. as this. This design is a period-style fast draw rig I co-designed with Thel Reed, who's the gun coach we work with on many of the movies. Mm -hmm. And he gave me the parameters of how he wanted the gun to sit, access around the grip and the trigger, how low to cut in the front. And Thel doesn't know this is coming to him yet. Oh, this is a surprise for yes, Thel. Yes, we, we made a carved rig for him. <laughs> it's beautiful, man. He's just going to get it dropped on him as from a great height. Yeah, awesome. Congratulations, Thel. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, let's jump into this and show people Surely. how you do this. We're going to skip through some things that we've done in a bunch of different videos just to make this a shorter, a quicker. A lot of the techniques are yeah. repetitive. So we'll give you the high points of how yeah. it goes from this to this. When you're making cowboy rigs, there's the two basic elements, the belt, usually with cartridge loops, and the holster. Going to start with the belt, as I have everything laid out here for it. You need one strip of pretty heavy, like 10, 11 ounce, or that kind of thickness of leather. These are the Ranger style belts, which were very common in the West. The Ranger style used the billet that sews on to do the buckling, rather than the end of the belt itself running through the buckle. So, to do the billet belts, I made a template that shows me the end of the belt, where to put the billet. Yeah. Really? Yeah. When you're doing the Ranger style belts, you need a pattern that's going to show you how far back to set your billet and also for the overall length of the belt. I mark the end there. I mark that little dot which is going to show me middle hole. And then this cutout lets me trace the base where it's going to be attached. Next, figuring on the waist size, I measure from the dot that I made for the middle hole of the billet out to the end. A general rule on these gun belts, which are going to be worn over a trouser belt, is it adds somewhere around four and a half or five inches to your true waist size. So if you're 35, it's got to be cut for about a 40, otherwise you're going to end up short. So, Okay, and then it's usually that thickness? Usually. I like to build with a very heavy leather because I don't want them stretching and deforming over years of use. Plus, it's going to support a lot of gun weight. So if you start heavy, you don't have to worry about it down the road. I just reverse my pattern here to get this end and mark where this billet will go. Now I cut a little slot in the belt, in the belt pattern, because this billet is going to sit much closer, this is the one the buckle attaches to, than the long one which will have that. So it gives me both lengths I can use. Now for the bullet loops, usually the loops are centered. So I'll measure the distance in between the ends of the billets. I've got 29. So that would be about 14 and a half when you split it in two. Make a tiny mark. And we have the bullet loop pattern. Center is marked, so I just line it up with that little pick mark. And trace out all the slots for the bullets stand in. Next we need to cut the belt to length.
using this push through method with the carpet behind, I can get it all off in one pass and not have to keep dragging my knife over the same place over and over. Short sawing motions with the blade pointed away gives you a lot of control. Next, we need to punch all the slots out for the bullet loops. So we're going to step over to the clicker press. That makes a great anvil to punch on. Now, people may wonder why I'm putting a rubber glove on this hand. This is Florida, and it's summertime. You just run with sweat, and if the sweat gets on the leather, it can create black stains. So we use a lot of these around the shop throughout the summer. To prevent accidents and bounce backs, I usually walk down the lopes, putting a dent from the punch in, because when you hit hard, it tends to bounce unless you've got a really good grip on the shaft of the punch. This helps me get everything centered before I come back and smack them all the way through. Is there also a standard number of uh, bullet loops that we're putting on there? It usually depends on the waist size of the person who's going to wear it. This is 24 loops, and we usually do it in multiples of six, although Good. some people just like loops run from one end to the other, as many as you can get on. It depends. It's really up to the customer. Okay, now they have my holes dented. It's thick leather, so it takes a really good smack to get through. Sometimes more than one. This way I can feel the punch getting down into the mark we made and know that I'm on the spot. Kind of like making a pilot hole. Exactly. And every once in a while, <laughs> knock out all the accumulated leather that's building up inside the pipe. This is one of the places where it doesn't pay to rush. Because if it bounces and puts a crosswise mark on the leather, you're starting over. And uh, where did you get this tool from? I had this punch made by the same people who make my clicker dies. You can get regular slot punches from many leather supply houses, however they're pretty narrow and I needed a little wider punch because I'm running two four five ounce straps through it back and forth and it sure makes life easier. ready to make bullet loops. The strip to make the loops for the bullets, I usually cut out of four or five ounce leather. Some people use lighter, but it can stretch and then the loop gets too loose on the bullet. To decorate this, take the groover, set it for a narrow groove, and run it down the edge. Since it is flexible leather, it's hard to hold it in place and groove at the same time, so I take a very heavy weight on the end and that anchors it so that I can run the groove more or less in one go. it over and get to the other side. Sometimes with this real soft stuff, if I'm not careful, it will run off an edge. It's actually more difficult to work with light and flexible leather than it is to work with stiff and heavy leather. Mm -hmm. It's like that Cursed ostrich skin. 
Well, I hear the rain starting up again outside, and since this building has a tin roof, I'm afraid it's going to interfere a bit. Hearing us, I'll just try to speak up and be clear. Okay. Once we have the loop strip made, cut one end narrow, and then I take a hammer and I hammer the end of the leather to compress it, which makes it easier to slide through the loop. And I found the secret to doing good bullet loops is not to overwet the leather. The strap needs to be damp, but if I overwet it, it's going to stretch entirely out of shape, and by the time I get to the end, I'll have wide loops here and thin loops there. And that just isn't very impressive. So I bring the strap up through the hole, then I take the end I've hammered on into the same hole, pull on it until it hits my thumb, take an empty cartridge case, put it in there, and give it a sharp little tug to pull it taut around the case. Find the end again, and repeat it in the next slot. I pull back with my thumb on the strap over the loop I just made to open that up so it's easier to get the strap through again for this next one. These things will try to bunch up on you when you have a long strip going. One method that makes it easier is as I bring this through, I throw it over my shoulder, which keeps it straight for when I want to bring the end down and start the next one. The further you go, the shorter the strap becomes, the easier it is to deal with. But in the beginning, it's wrestling an octopus. And then I add a little water to each side, just doing about six or eight inches at a time so I don't end up overdoing it. And sometimes I give it a little push down on the back want my leather laying very flat there. If it bows up, it could result in a loose cartridge loop. And that is to be avoided. One of the classic Western gun belt designs that's in our catalog, the Arizona rig, is four and a half inches wide on the belt and has two rows of loops, one top and bottom, the entire length. That takes quite a deal of time to get done. have to be built to last a lifetime. Oh yes, you're not going to go in and redo your loops. You'd have to take the entire thing apart. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons to start with sturdy and fairly heavy materials. It's so much quicker and easier when you're reaching the end of the loops, you don't have quite so much trying to wrestle with. It goes a lot faster. It sure is easier when you get toward the end of the row of loops because the excess you're dealing with is not so much like wrestling a snake. It's much quicker, gets everything in the right place that much more easily. Now we have a full complement of bullet loops for this belt. Everything pulled taut and snug, flat on the back. But we're going to let this dry for a little while before we install the lining on the belt. 
most important thing a gun belt rig is going to need is the holster. Otherwise, it's just a fancy belt. So, we're going to take the pattern. I like my third hand piece of lead, which keeps everything in place. Place it on the leather. Again, it's a good heavy 10 to 11 ounce leather. This way, when we get the holster formed and molded, it's got the body to stand up to just about anything. Trace out the pattern. And I mark all my slots and hardware holes, which makes putting it together later so much easier. Now for the welt, which is the spacer part that's going to go between, I just use the edge of my pattern and slide it over a little bit to make a parallel line and create the welt that way. Again, using the knife over the carpet in the forward pushing style lets me get it all cut out in one pass and control the direction of the cut much, much more easily than drawing it toward me. Now, it's important to turn the work and keep cutting away from yourself. If you come to curves and corners where you want to try to break your wrist and cut in a different direction, you lose a lot of the control. So I'm forever spinning around the table moving the hide so I can keep cutting straight away which is also a good safety issue because if the knife slips I'm not coming back towards myself. Holster pattern, ready for hardware. And on this holster, we did a pair of the holster bands, the pieces that go around the holster body and attach it to the backing. But we just got a little more stylish than the usual loop or oval, because what expert gunfighter doesn't like to show off a little bit? If your blade gets dull while you're cutting, I like to make a sharpening strop out of an old piece of scrap leather, rub some green sharpening rouge into it, and just like with a straight razor, with a few strokes, really improves the cutting edge. So much easier. That's the cutting. Oh dear. I almost forgot the welt. I would have looked very silly trying to put it together. Oh, this leather is fibery. Let's get all the little final hairs to part. Now we have our pieces all cut out, start the assembly. We need to punch two slots in the holster body for the hammer thong. 
to slide through, securing the weapon when you're riding your wild horse or other cowboy activities. And then for the belt lockdown, we'll be installing a T-nut there. I put a little dent in these other holes for guidance later, but I wait until the lining has been glued on before I punch them. This it goes to both layers. I like to turn this one and punch it again from the back so the leather is flowing that way. It makes it easier inserting the hardware. T-nut has a wide base with prongs that stick into the leather. Keeps it from turning. These make an excellent blind nut when you have to put something inside and you don't want it spinning on you. In order to keep it lined up in the hole on my anvil, I'll use a screw as a centering pin. That goes into the hole, lets me know that I'm not going to drive the T-nut into the steel, which is usually fatal for the T-nut. And there it's ready. The next step on the holster is to install the line. One, we don't want bare metal, we're just going to scratch the gun. Two, like a nice smooth interior, again, let's keep the finish on the pistol, not in the holster. So, I have a lighter piece of 3-4 ounce, which we're going to glue on to be the inside. Little tip, since we need this to be a tunnel for the hammer thong to slide in, we don't want any glue getting in between those slots. That would make it very difficult to install a flexible piece of leather. We're going to spread the glue all over both halves, the holster face and the lining. I use the barred cement, which is an extremely strong contact cement used by the shoe industry to keep the soles on your sneakers but you want to have a lot of ventilation when you're using it. It's got some bad chemicals. That's why we can't air condition this shop and have to work in the heat because we need the constant air exchange for these things that we use. Otherwise, we would soon forget our own names. And um, for anyone who wants to do this themselves, where, where do you get your supplies and stuff like that? Well, the Tandy leather stores now carry the barge cement. They have a great many of the tools that we're using. There's also weaver leather up in Ohio, very good source. You can find them all online. There's quite a number of leather supply houses, tools, materials, finishes, and it's just a matter of what you want to build. So that side, let it get tacky. We'll put a light coating on this side because contact cement really sticks to itself, so you need it on both surfaces. So I think you've said it before with the glue, you're trying to avoid getting right up to the edge, right? Well, on the lining, I don't get quite up to the edge. Mm -hmm. On the holster itself, I have to get right up to the edge in order to get a good bond. But it's important when you're coming to the edge in the holster to glue from the inside out. You never want to glue in this way because you'll scrape glue off along the outside and it can get on the face of the holster. I need to give that just a minute to cure before I put it together, so that's a good time to glue the lining in the belt. We have a lot of excess material from making the bullet loops. So it's time to cut that off. I leave about an inch and a half sticking out each side. This we glue down and then it gets glued over with the lining. So it's held sandwiched like so, and will not come undone. This isn't so critical on a leather line belt, but if you're doing a suede lining and you plan to put oil finish on the belt, it's a good idea to put two layers of glue 
on the back of the bullet loops because each of those little splits is a seam and oil can seep in there and stain the back of a suede lining. Since it's a leather lined leather, it's all going to get the same treatment. It's not so critical, but it's a good tip for when you're doing a suede line. While I've been gluing the belt, that's given the holster glue time to set up. We can now apply it. I like to look straight down over it so I don't run off the edge anywhere. Because if you put this stuff together, it is really hard to pull apart. Then take a smooth piece of plastic. You can use wood or almost anything. It won't scratch the leather and rub it down especially around the edge to get that good bond, that good seal, so nothing comes apart. There you go. One lining installed. I'm going to leave this set just a minute. Here's another place where my lead block comes in very handy. I have to take this off the edge when I'm trimming it, and that helps keep everything in place and gives me something to pull against to keep the lining leather taut as I cut it away, following the edge of the heavier leather around. You want to be careful as you cut along the edge of the holster, parting the lining, because if you push a little too hard from the wrong direction, you can slice right into the holster. And then I'm using very ill language and don't want the children around to hear it. Once we've got the lining all squared away and trimmed down to the holster, I take my, bevel, my groover, <laughs> I haven't got to the bevel yet, take my groover and set it for the width of the stitch that I want to run on there. Mark where the stitches go in across the bottom and all across the top. I don't groove these edges because they're the last thing that will be stitched when the holster is bent together and the welt installed. So, everything in its time. That's the holster ready for stitching. We'll bring our belt back in. Instead of laying the belt down all in one go, which is difficult to manage, I'll start with one end and then walk it on to the lining, which lets me adjust as I go, so we don't end up too close to one edge or the other, or running off. Now, this belt, being the reed design for fast draw, is done with the rough side out. That helps grip around you when you're wearing it, whereas a smooth leather would tend to slide a bit. Most leather line belts are done with a smooth on the inside, but this has a practical purpose. Now time to get rid of the shells from the bullet loops. You don't want to leave them in terribly long 
after looping because if they draw around the cartridge case then it's going to be a little bit loose. As it dries the leather shrinks up a bit if the case is not in there, especially if you can take the time to put it out in the sunlight for a few hours. It makes a much sturdier loop on the case. Oh, and bending the belt like this takes the tension off of these and lets them slide out more easily. If I'm trying to pull it out flat, it's more of a struggle. The lining on the belt gets the same trim as on the holster. My heavy lead weight lets me keep that end from falling off as I bring the knife down. It's much easier trimming the belt as you don't have all the curves the holster has. Just important to keep the blade straight and pressed against the side of the belt so we don't cut into it. As with the holster, we'll put the stitching groove around the edge of the belt. Not only does it give me a line to follow when I'm sewing, but the groove helps the stitching lie down a little below the surface, less liable to wear off, get snagged on anything. for stitching. The next step is to sew these layers together. For this I trust my old Landis sewing machine, pushing a hundred years old now, but these old harness stitchers keep on going and there's really no modern machines that can do as well.
beautiful job of stitching, they do. Next, we give the belt the same treatment. As the belt is thicker, I'm going to adjust the presser foot height so it's not too tight and where it holds it. After stitching it, you want to remove the stitches below flush if you can. I use an old medical scalpel which has a very fine point I can get down into the holes and cut them off below flush. I basically hold the blade against the thread and then pull the thread onto the blade. This lets me have more control and I don't end up with tufts of loose thread sticking out of the holes. Now on the back, if you wish to, you can take it off flat because that's all going to be folded together and covered. But the front was where I was concerned. Now before we do all the beveling and slicking, we need to true the edge, so over to the belt sander. we've trued up the edges with the sander so they're even, we need to bevel it. I've been very taken with these new craft tool bevelers that Tandy is selling. They're really quite good. They have a rounded cutting face, come in multiple sizes, and they do an excellent job cutting a rounded edge into the leather. I'm using the number three at a medium size on the inside because I want more of a bevel on the edge where the gun is going to come in and out. So cylinder edges and such 
aren't as liable to catch the edge of the holster, make more of a funnel effect. And on the outside, I use the number two. Doesn't cut off quite so much. You don't want to cut excessively in beveling because if you do, you can end up with a knife edge instead of a nice rounded edge. And it's much harder to come back from. beveled. Now time to slick it. Slicking. Machine slicking will do about 80% of the job of slicking. And then to get a really fine, smooth edge on it, and back to the hand tools. As I say, the machine does a good job of getting a basic slick on the edge. But if you rub it down with a smooth wooden tool handle, and I'm putting more emphasis on when I stroke toward myself here. I want all the fibers laying down in one direction for when I put the edge coat on, I'm not fighting a rough edge. Then again, smooth piece of plastic and press it down because when you do the slicking on the edge, you can mushroom it a bit because the leather is wet and malleable. By pressing it down, it condenses all the fibers. You get a really good slick hard, firm edge. And I come at this from three angles. Inside, sort of flat, and then from outside to round it off. Here's a little cheat that really helps. Brandon Jones over at Badge Envy found us some of these pulley wheels. They're just slick, hard plastic pulley wheels, but they make a great slicking tool for the heavier leather and help you really get that mirrored edge on there. You can hunt for them at your hardware store. Just basic pulley wheel. dense, hard, rounded edge, smooth like glass. Now that we have the edges done, top and bottom, everything is ready to bring the sides together and form the holster. Because it's heavy leather, if you just try to bend it dry, there's a good chance you'll crack it on the outside. I dampen the leather before I bend it. I don't want to soak it and make it soft. Just Give it enough stretch that when I bring it around, we're not going to get cracks on the outside of the bend. Now it's time to install the welt that we cut. I usually glue it to one side 
let that adhere and then bring it together with the other. If you try to do both sides at once and bring it together like a sandwich, something always shifts and then you're fighting with it, trying to move things back and forth and it's a good way to be frustrated. This takes longer, but it's easier on your nerves and you don't have to go back and do things over so many times. Now, I can go ahead and put the glue on this side so it will start curing, getting ready to hold. But I'm going to wait to put the glue on the face of the welt after it's well adhered to the front. All right, now the glue is cured, ready to go. I start the welt at the top, matching the corners. And as I walk it down, I'm checking it with my finger. I don't want the welt to be below the edge of the holster because then when I go to sand it true, I'm gonna to have to gouge away so much leather that it'll change the shape. So I leave just a tiny little bit of the welt standing up above the edge of the holster body itself. Get that well set. Now we can put the glue on the welt to get the whole thing closed up. I'm trying to go a little light on this glue, not gob it on, because it will dry more quickly and I can assemble it more quickly if it isn't too thick. Now this glue has gotten tacky. I'm bringing the edges together. Again, starting at the top, join my points. And then I carefully walk it down, bringing them together so that my welt in the center is nowhere lower than the edge of the holster itself. Now to make sure that this is really well joined, I'll often take the rubber mallet and give it a, a knock on top of the anvil. But this felt really solid going together. I don't think I have to do that today. Time to sand it smooth. This is evened up for stitching. After I stitch it, I'll give it another light sanding because the pounding of the presser foot on the stitcher can shift things a little bit. This has shifted just a little bit because of the presser foot hitting it, so now give it the final sand and get it all true. actual cutting step on these is to bevel the main seam. Since it's very thick, I often do it two angles. I did a flat angle there. Then I come and I roll a bit over more just to get that little edge that forms because you want it nicely rounded. Same thing on the back. any little corner tufts form. Now once this is slicked, we'll be ready to fit it for its weapon. We just 
just need to slick this edge. Good. ready for the final step. Alright, after all those assembly steps we're ready to fit it for the firearm. The first thing we do is wet it, because wet leather is moldable. Very often I'll have this warmed up by the hot plate. Right now in this summer heat it isn't such an issue, but in the winter Having the water warm makes the leather work a lot more easily. First thing I do is bend the belt loop. I'm lining this up with the hole I know that it's going to go into in the back. And creasing it down to get the bend. I don't want to hammer on it or use too much force. Again, you can crack the leather across the top if you're true too rough on it, but leaning your body weight will do the job. And for the holster itself, I want to open it out a little bit. And this is for Single Action Army, the classic cowboy colt. The holster is a five and a half inch. My model is a seven and a half. It's not going to matter. This hangs out the end. Because some of the colts have the big bullseye ejector, a neat trick is just tape a dowel here under the barrel and when you mold it that creates a tunnel so if they do have the big bullseye ejector it's not dragging, it will run smoothly. I've gloved up again for this operation because Florida has not gotten any cooler today and the last thing I want to do on the last step is get big black sweat stains on the leather. So we come prepared to operate. Get my dowel down the top to make the sight channel and apply the wax stick. To get it driven up on top of the frame and drive it up on top of the receiver, up on the top band, and then I set that on top of the front sight to keep the tension top and bottom. This is all finished except for opening up the channel for the hammer thong, which I do by the simple expedient of working the screwdriver through there. Lifting and twisting a little bit it opens the tunnel and that lets us align the thong in. One thing I haven't done yet, flaring the mouth of the holster right over the cylinder edge is important. You don't want the leather laying flat flat because when people return the gun the edge of the cylinder is going to catch on it. So by putting your finger under there and just gently biasing the edge outward a bit, you create more of a funnel effect for returning the firearm. In many of the other videos we've done, I've used my tools to bone the holster. That is to get the molding high detail where you can see the weapon right through the leather. These are period correct rigs that I'm making with Mr. Reed. And in the 1800s, there was no boning. They wet the leather, they put the weapon in, it dried. So this is the proper look for the 1800s holster.
All right, guys. So there's a little bit more to it than that. However, we want to make this yeah. short, right? Or normally, short enough. Normally, when we've shown how to build things, we've carried them through the finishing and the coloring and all the steps. But today, we have some time constraints. Yeah. And the holster we just made is going to need a day or more to dry before it can have the color. And we're just not going to be in the same zip code for that long. Yeah. <laughs> we, so. We, so what we suggest you guys do is you can look at all the other videos that we've done that mm -hmm. sh show most of that. Oh. Um, as we're, well as the carving on here, it's something that we'll have to roll in pictures because someone exactly. else does that. Mm -hmm. But this is the finished product of what we've been building. The rough out interior to grip the shooter. Mm -hmm. The slight forward angle cant of the mm -hmm. holster. And plenty of hand clearance for when you want to get your iron out fast. Okay, very nice. So how typically how long does it take to build something like this, including the the, uh, the artwork that's on it? Well, the carving, as I say, Dominic does that and many, many, many hours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not fast if you're going to do it well. Yeah. Now, for people who are interested in having a carved rig, He's more than willing to do them, but I have to warn you, you're adding many hundreds of dollars to mm -hmm. the regular price of a thing. Yeah. Um, it, it is well worth it if you have the budget to do that because it's very beautiful. It makes it very unique. Yeah. Uh, overall, what are we looking at something like this without the artwork? A regular rig like mm -hmm. this plane, the way we were making it today, right. probably run around 450 450 right. and then when you add the artwork carving again I'd have to calculate the hours but you're probably adding another three or four hundred dollars if you're going to do it fully carved depending on what you want to do yeah and then you can also do things like adding silver oh, and buckle like shows silver yeah. buckles letters. all kinds of awesomeness <laughs> <laughs> you, you can get very very glittery with these yes okay so typically if someone orders this from you from scratch and you know they They've got all the cu different custom things they want out of that. How long does it take for you to complete At it? At this moment, I'm running about eight or ten weeks out on mm -hmm. these really custom things. Always subject to change depending on how loaded down we are. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, you know what, Sam? Thanks a lot for showing us it's this. I really great. appreciate it. It just blows my mind how much work goes into something like this. But it's very beautiful, well worth it. Um, you know, if there's, if you want something from the movies or if you shoot the sure. cowboy action exactly. genre, I don't even know what they call it. What do they call that? Single action. Okay, single Sass. action. Okay. Sass. Single action shooting society. Okay, there you go. So if you shoot in that, great rig, you know, you want, you want to brag about your skills. Absolutely. Best way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> or if you just want to reminisce of what it was like back in the olden days. There you go. Yeah. Very nice. Thanks a lot, Sam. I appreciate it. Pleasure, sir. So, Thank uh, you for watching. Absolutely. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, we'll try to condense this down as much as we can with all the different details <laughs> that are included in this. Please do go to the other videos that we have. And if you guys would like to see something in particular here, be sure to uh, let us know in this video. And uh, if you're interested in ordering something, you have to go to Andrew's Custom dot com oh, andrews leather excuse me andrews leather dot com excuse me and uh, and then oh they have to call you right they have to call us to yeah. get all the details right right and that would be in the description as well the phone number so we'll put all those things there call up sam and uh get your rig set up <laughs> until then we're out of here Thank you.